Welcome back from the break. Welcome back from the break. We are going to get started. Hope you got your coffee and your drinks. We heard from five distinguished speakers in the first panel, guiding us along transformative avenues for education and public health. Our second panel of this program is leading the change, challenges and opportunities in academic public health. I'm your moderator, Liz Weiss. Each upcoming speaker will help take us further along in framing our future to help ensure health equity for all. Our panel two speakers follow. First, we will hear from Diane Marie St. George. Dr. St. George serves as Associate Professor and Director of the MPH program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine Public Health Programs. Dr. St. George also chairs the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. And she is a member of the association's Framing the Future Expert Panel on Inclusive Excellence Through an Anti-Racism Lens. Second, we will hear from Mark Kivanemi. Dr. Kivanemi is the Development Dimensions International Endowed Professor of Health, Behavior, and Society at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. Dr. Kivanemi is a social health psychologist whose work focuses on understanding how people make decisions about engaging in health-related behaviors, how individuals process and respond to information about their health, and how to communicate that information most effectively. Dr. Kibanemi also is co-chair of the Framing the Future expert panel on expanding the reach, visibility, and impact of academic public health. He also chaired the Association of Schools and Program of Public Health Teaching Work Group within the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Task Force. Then we will turn to Heather Hegman and Sierra C.J. Walker, who will co-present. Ms. Hegman is the inaugural director of the Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education at Washington University in St. Louis Medical Campus. Her background is in strategic planning, program and outcomes assessment, accreditation, and project management. Ms. Walker serves, Ms. Walker serves as president and CEO of the St. Louis Community Health Worker Coalition. Ms. Walker received her master's in public health with a concentration in prevention science from Emory University's executive MPH program. Sierra is currently doctoral student in the public health leadership program at the University of Illinois Chicago, where she will earn a DRPH. Taking a keen focus in social epidemiology, her research explores the business of public health, illustrating community-based innovation and non-traditional partnerships as levers for sustainability. Finally, we will hear from Paul K. Halverson. Dr. Halverson is the founding dean of the Indiana University Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health in Indianapolis. He came to Indiana University from the Arkansas Department of Health, where he served as state health officer and director. Prior to his appointment as state health officer, Dr. Halverson served in senior management roles at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and as the Senior Health Policy Advisor for the North Carolina Department of Environment, Health, and Natural Resources. Now, please join me in welcoming Diane Marie, Associate Professor and Director of the MPH Program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine Public Health Programs to the stage. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. First, let me thank the symposium organizers for inviting me to join this panel this morning. They asked me to speak on holding ourselves accountable for moving academic public health forward with respect to issues related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. As we parse that out though, we are really thinking about a tripartite mission. 
The first part of our mission is ensuring that our staff, students, and faculty represent the communities which we strive to serve. Despite some laudatory efforts to address lack of diversity as a whole, our institutions still do not fully reflect our communities. There's indeed been progress, but we are not there yet. The second part of our mission is ensuring that the environments in which we teach and learn uphold the highest ideals for inclusivity, justice, and respect. Climate surveys tell a story of institutions that do not feel the same for all of us. Some may feel comfortable feeling that they fit in and belong, but others do not. The third part of our mission is to move us all toward health equity. We do that through our scholarship when we produce the evidence that uncovers the systems, structures, and practices that create and perpetuate the disparities we observe. And then more importantly, when we produce the evidence upon which to base interventions that effectively address the problems that we find. We also move us toward health equity when our public health practice efforts strive for authentic, mutually beneficial partnerships that identify and meet the needs of communities. And of course, we move us to health equity by training the next generation of public health leaders which, with the skills that they will in turn use to engage effectively as culturally humble scholars and practitioners into the future. With that in mind, I'd like to share with you some of the ways that ASPPH has convened us, the members, to focus on some of these pressing issues that we are facing. <laughs> Sorry. In 2019, ASPPH impaneled a group to develop a statement on zero tolerance of discrimination and harassment. Putting a stake in the ground, they envisioned academic public health institutions that were free of the micro and macro aggressions that make our teaching and learning spaces toxic environments. The statement called for preventive measures, anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policies, not just ones that were created and sat on a shelf, but living ones that evolved as we, the world, evolved. It called for training of students, staff, and faculty to change behavior and challenge biased worldviews. And it also called for creation of a culture of accountability in which everyone recognized their responsibility to ensure that bad actors were identified and reported and victims were protected. The statement also called for clear and consistent communication and transparency about how perpetrators are held accountable. And finally, shifting the culture away from one which facilitates harassment and discrimination to one in which institutional norms demand equity and respect. But only one year later, in 2020, as our world changed in front of our eyes and the calls for action grew stronger and clearer, ASPPH commissioned another task force to go further, think broader, dig deeper, and develop a framework for dismantling structural racism in academic public health. This framework challenges us to tackle the processes and policies that enable and sustain racism in our institutions. With input from our sections and committees, the framework offered recommendations for actions to impact our five constituencies, the public health workforce, the communities and populations we serve, the staff, the students and alumni, and the faculty. For each of these constituencies, we recognize that we needed to consider strategies that related to our three domains of influence, education, pedagogy, and training as one, practice as another, and research as a third. Across these five populations and three domains, there are multiple strategies that have the potential to affect immediate change. Efforts such as holding listening sessions with our students, our staff, and faculty to understand their lived experiences. Or creating teaching practice and research awards that recognize staff and faculty excellence in addressing barriers to equity. Or involving students in community-engaged research or ensuring that student practice placements include not only a diverse array of communities, but that the students benefit from mentoring by a diverse array of community preceptors. Strategies that take a little more time to implement but may go even further include actions such as developing uni university mechanisms for adequately and fairly compensating community members for service they provide, 
or tackling outdated um, appointment promotion and tenure guidelines that fail to recognize the value of DEIJ work, participatory research, and the time that it takes to do all of this well. Or creating alternative faculty lines with flexibility to appoint community-based practitioners whose expertise is so sorely needed in our classrooms. And of course, there are those actions that will take more time, but are so critically important as well, such as advocacy at state and federal levels for creative and sustained funding to support work that seeds our pipeline with the future public health leaders and health equity change agents. I think it's me. The ASPPH work in this area continues with the Framing the Future panel on inclusive excellence through an anti-racism lens. As the panel tries to envision a diverse, equitable, inclusive academic public health of the future, we are channeling the collective wisdom of the previous work groups and sharing experiences from our respective institutions. One such effort was our preliminary environmental scan, which sought to answer five key questions. First, we asked our key informants, what is happening out there? What are programs and schools doing to achieve inclusive excellence? What are those systems, structures, policies, et cetera? Second, we wanted to understand the implementation. How are they making these things happen at their institution? Thirdly, what are the results of those initiatives? Where have they seen impact? Fourth, what has helped or hindered their progress? And lastly, how do they plan to keep this growing? What are the mechanisms in place to sustain progress? Data collection on this environmental scan is now complete and over the next few months, findings will be released. And we can all look forward to learning what has been found to be successful, what has not worked so well, and what contextual factors are important in contributing to success. So to conclude, it is very easy for us to throw our hands up and say that the system took centuries to create and cannot easily be disrupted. And that of course would be correct. <laughs> However, none of us ever signed up for this job because it was easy. We signed up because we are passionate about leaving this place better than we found it and creating a brighter future for the generations to come. And deep down inside, we knew it was going to be tough. And of course, we know that for some of us, the job is even tougher. We've heard references to that already today. Let us recognize that there are those among us right now who are being forced to engage with this work under very difficult conditions. Their environments are less receptive to this change and enormous barriers stand in their way. So we stand by that, those colleagues, supporting them, applauding them for their valor and honoring their commitment by realizing that those of us who can do more must do more digging in more deeply and expanding the evidence base so that there can be no doubt in anyone's mind of the necessity for and value of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. St. George. We will now hear from Mark Benemi, Dimensions International Endowed Professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Society at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, everybody, uh, both you who are, who are in the room and the people in the little camera lens in the back. It's great to have so many people interested uh, in uh, improving teaching and learning for equity. So we've heard a lot of calls to action today about changing what we do in our classrooms and other learning spaces to rebuild trust in public health, to create lifelong learners, to start to work towards liberation, to dismantle racist structures. And the question is, how do we do that more effectively and to make sure that what we're doing is making a difference? And I wanna start that question with an observation. For those of us in public health, in practice, we have been an evidence-based or evidence-informed discipline, basically as long as we've been a discipline. We've long collected data to understand what kinds of problems we need to address, figuring out which interventions we need to do. And after we've gotten the spanner and taken the handle off the, the pump, collecting data to make sure that those interventions were effective. We're really good at it, and we have developed a lot of very sophisticated tools to help us use evidence and collect evidence effectively towards public health practice. And then we come to teaching. 
where truth be told, more often than not in our classrooms, we're teaching the way that we were taught by somebody who was taught the way that they were taught, taught the way that they were taught all the way back to a case where our classrooms today often don't look that different from times of yore. And just for a moment, my favorite part about this picture is the dude in the bottom right corner who's the first documented student to fall asleep during class. <laughs> So as we think about this route towards transformation and all the ways that we've talked about today, the question is how can we leverage our work in public health practice to think about doing this transformational work in a way that truly improves student learning? Often when you start to have this conversation with our faculty, the response is, well, I was never trained to do that. Nobody ever taught me how to teach. I don't know how to do scholarship teaching and learning. This is really intimidating. And by the way, I have a day job. And every single bit of that is true. But if we think about where we are as a field, the truth is that we are remarkably well equipped to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning if we stop using that word and use the, the word evidence-based teaching and learning because we're quite good at answering the question, does it improve public health? And the question of does it improve teaching and learning is that actually not that different. So what I'd like to do with the rest of the time is to show you some ways in which evidence-based teaching and learning or scholarship of teaching and learning can leverage what we already know about evidence-based public health to reduce the barriers to entry. If you are an instructor, a faculty member, I hope you will see ways in which you can incorporate scholarship of teaching and learning in your own practice using things you already know. If you are someone who works with faculty on improving teaching and, and, and creating environments for student learning, I hope you will see lenses through which you can work with faculty to have this conversation. So how do we do this? I, from time to time, teach evidence-based public health. And what I tell my students when I do that is that the very best intervention is the one that you don't have to create. Right? If you can find an existing intervention that someone has already created and shown to be effective and it works in your context, run with it. So an important evidence-based point for teaching and learning is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel in the same way that we talk about using things like the Community Guide to Preventive Services to find interventions for public health practice. There is a wealth of scholarship and a wealth of knowledge about evidence-based teaching and learning already out there. These are a few of my favorites. If you're looking for a place to start, I wanna take just a moment and put in a plug for the resource in the bottom right corner. So ASPPH recently created a teaching and learning resources hub as a member resource. It is a place where you can go and find evidence-based teaching solutions that your colleagues have put forward as uh, exemplars of good practice. If you are someone who's already doing this work, you can submit your work, you can have it peer reviewed. So there is some cachet towards this being a form of scholarship. If you're here in the room, there will be a table later uh, to find out more about the hub. If you're joining us online, uh, it is available at the ASPPH member resource site. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A second thing we're really good at doing in public health is leveraging existing data sources. So oftentimes we don't have the energy, the person power, the money power, whatever it is to collect original data for everything we do. And the same can be true for the scholarship of teaching and learning, that we have a wealth of data that we're already collecting and can bring to bear to think about ways to improve our assessment of student learning. I'll show you one example of this. So a few years ago, I got interested in flipped classroom or blended learning approaches to education. And I took a course that I taught a number of times in a traditional do some lecturing and try to fit in activities where you can format, switched it to, to, to blended learning. Wanted to see if that was effective because of course you wanna make sure that you're actually improving things and not making things worse when you make a change in your educational practice. All I did was keep the exam set the same from one semester to another. And with data that already existed, I was able to look at the change that took place in student learning without doing anything that I wasn't already collecting as a part of the assessment portion of teaching. And it's even already in an Excel file that's formatted perfectly for analyzing data. You can think about other sources of existing data. So looking at comments and student evaluations, 
doing content analysis to see if it's working. And in this case, about 75% of students' comments about what was working well in the course after the transformation had to do with something about that blended learning format and only about 20% of the needs improvement. So without collecting any additional data, you already have the ability to go in and ask whether teaching and learning is working and finding out what's working well and what needs to be improved in your classroom environment. The last point in terms of connections to evidence-based public health is that not everything has to be a randomized clinical trial. When we see the words scholarship of teaching and learning in all capital letters, and it sounds very imposing, we tend to think about very involved, you know, uh, hard to do, and again, with the day job research designs. But there are a number of valid ways of knowing in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Doing quasi-experimental work, as I, as I demonstrated earlier, doing case studies, pre-post designs, there are all sorts of ways that actually do work in the context of a busy faculty member to do this work. So by leveraging those kinds of knowledge and skills that we already have, we can lower the barrier to entry for doing truly evidence-based teaching as we're doing this work of transforming our classrooms to meet the needs of public health in the future. One final point related to that is that if we think about the essential public health services, we go through a framework of assessing what needs to be done, creating interventions to do it, and then making sure that those interventions work. And that same warp and weave works for teaching and learning. What do our students not know coming into our classrooms that they need to know? Policy development is essentially how do we create the interventions? And teaching and learning is an intervention like any other in order to do that effectively. And then how do we make sure that those interventions work? So in closing, you know, where do we go from here? Hopefully you'll see you have a new set of tools in your toolbox for doing this kind of work. So I'd ask you to reflect on two questions. How will your teaching and learning practice change based on what you've learned here today, either from this talk or from others in the session? More importantly, what will you do to evangelize and talk to a colleague about what you've learned today? And then the last thing to say is that if you are in academic leadership in a school program of public health, I just spent eight minutes trying to make this seem really easy and simple and anybody can do it. Forget all of that for a second, because if you're in academic leadership, my challenge for you is to see the parallels to evidence-based public health practice and to research practice and think about what will you do to recognize that high quality teaching and learning and evidence-based teaching and learning requires the same rigor and the same specialization as the other parts of the faculty role and create mechanisms for honoring it and rewarding it in the same way that we do others. But regardless of the way that we do that, go out, explore, investigate, and I look forward to the rest of the talks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Up next is a joint presentation by Heather Hagman, Director, Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education at Washington University Medical Center, and Sierra C.J. Walker, President and CEO of the St. Louis Community Health Worker Coalition. Thank you for the invitation to share about our center. As director of the Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education on the Washington University Medical Campus, uh, a collaboration of three freestanding schools on that campus, I, as well as the national interprofessional education community, am anxiously awaiting the soon to be released updates to the Interprofessional Education Collaborative's uh, competencies, known as IPEC. In particular, the strengthening of the principles of public health structural and social determinants of health and just culture, I am hopeful that these changes will help further flatten the medical hierarchy that was alluded to earlier so that everyone is able to fully show up with all of their identities on teams toward achieving the quintuple aim for healthcare. The journey we wanna to share today started in 2018 when this incredible leader and I met co-presenting on a panel similar to this one Listening to her pre presentation about the emerging St. Louis Community Health Worker Coalition, I knew that I had found the community voice that we needed to follow and partner with to best train our health profession students to work in teams 
with community toward our vision of improving the health of the St. Louis region. I'll let CJ tell you the story. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So while I come to you outside of university representation and rather in partnership, I hope that you can understand my place in this conversation today. The hope is that we'll have the chance to really demonstrate a lot of what's been discussed and show that a path forward is truly possible. So what Heather and I have done, before I get into it, I, we do have a brief blurb on the screen, so I'll give you space to read that. But we just wanna quickly say thank you both to BU and ASPPH. I also wanna say thank you to you, Heather, for your authentic and demonstrative leadership. We're in St. Louis, so I must thank St. Louis for the way in which they've leaned into this work over five years. I'll also take a moment to thank the entire workforce here in St. Louis. We have over 180 trained CHWs who are on their way to being credentialed at the state. And he's gonna be really upset that I've done this, but I wanna take a moment to also thank a member of my team, Mr. Ryan Smith, who serves as our Director of CHW Leadership and Development. He is actually the first in the region to hold that title as we are actively building a career ladder. So in that, allow me the chance to really center us in this space around definition. Most often we will combine these two words and let them be synonymous. We'll talk about collaboration and partnership as if they are the same. But I wanna challenge that. And I know I'm speaking to the choir, so lean in a little bit. What if I told you that process was really collaboration and the product of collaboration is partnership. So we hear this famous mantra of form follows function. So what if I told you that the form of how we do our partnership is actually how we yield more, more effective collaboration? Let's make this a little bit more real. I'm a storyteller by nature, so, so bear with me. Inside of a city, we expect that there will be cultivation. We expect that things will come and grow from it. There are several similarities inside of a village as well. But let's talk about the differences. Maybe the pace, maybe the centrality, maybe the unison that happens in a village versus that of a city where there might be individualism or streets that separate the way in which you get places. Heather and I are representing a village inside of this city. The way in which we do that is through an evidence-based practice from the Teagle Foundation known as the Collaboration Continuum. What I'm challenging here is that collaboration is not a linear process, nor is it a one-time achievement. So our first meeting or our third meeting might not actually yield true collaboration. You'll notice that the formality of this relationship increases along with trust. So we're all practitioners here. And what I wanna do is make this real. So in order to get to a space of collaboration, we had to take it slow. We started in silo working. Then we started to network and you'll notice the information sheet that actually the Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education took ownership to create, to see if they were understanding what we were communicating correctly. Going forward, they invited us to do professional development sessions to their faculty and their students. And then you'll notice that in 2021, we, we signed a formal contract, but that wasn't a normal contract. Not only were we resourced for our time, but they actually agreed to all of our partnership values. So what most people might call an MOU, my organization calls a collaboration covenant. Because if we decide that we're gonna move into collaboration with you, because recognizing there are several other ways we can interact, we can network, we can get to know each other, but we don't have to collaborate because our reputation and the responsibility that we hold to our communities, to our members and those of which we serve will always be of utmost importance. So we walk our partners through a very smooth, but also respectful process using this continuum. And we will constantly say thank you to the Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education for their humility and for the reciprocal learning that we've engaged in. In 2021, you'll notice that Ryan Smith is listed as a member of the Curriculum Assessment Committee. That's big talk. Essentially, what we're saying is he's actively involved in the way in which the curriculum is evolving inside of that space. And for anyone who knows CHWs, this is not a degree credited program. So again, this was a risk taken in the university and a journey that was embraced. 
So as we think about how do we make this possible and a lot of what's been talked about today, we find comfort in frameworks. We find comfort in objectivity. We find comfort in steps. So our suggestion to you is to lean into the collaboration continuum and be real with yourself. There are three calls to actions here. The first is to assess where you really are. Where are you on that continuum and what capacities and interinstitutional supports might be needed? There's a full white paper on that continuum that we're happy to share if you wanna dig into it. Additionally, we're all very familiar with positionality. We must assess our bias and assumptions because the way in which you interact with others is solely contingent on that. The second might make us a little uncomfortable because we're known to be experts in the space, but I encourage you to ask. Ask for the supports that you need. Ask for accountability. And don't be afraid to ask for grace. This is a new process for all of us. When neighbors come to the table in this big institution, it's scary for them too. Similar to when we step into their territory. So let's be transparent and just ask for grace, which will yield natural accountability. And as I started this presentation, it's very important that we have clear definitions because that's when we start to miscommunicate. So let's talk about what success means to us. Let's confirm that we understand the spirit of reciprocity. And let's really explain what a partnership could be if we get collaboration right. And then my final comment, what I'll say is you must act. And you've heard that throughout this entire time. You must find a way to position yourself in a place of power that is both respectful, that is both humility, and that both allows you to really lean into a posture of yes. So with integrity and with shared ownership, we'll get there. So I just wanna close this by, again, we're all champions in this space, but it is very important that you champion not only inside of your institution, but you continue to do just what you're doing today and spread this word outside of those walls as well. So as the previous speaker has said, we have truncated this into a very abbreviated time, but we have a ton of lessons learned and we would love to share them with you. My organization provides asset mapping, think tanks, and deep workshopping where we will take you from your current place of that continuum and move you to your desired position. So again, thank you, Heather, for your demonstrative leadership. And thank you all for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hagman and Ms. Walker. We will now hear from Paul Halverson, founding dean of the Indiana University Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health. Thanks, Liz, and thanks for, for all of you and being here. I know this is the sort of optional session to, to come to today, but I think it really is a great way to start this section's retreat. I want to also acknowledge and thank uh, Dean Galeo. Uh, Sandro has always been a great leader and Boston University has been gracious in helping to move our, our field forward. And so thanks to, um, to BU, but also thanks to uh, ASPPH. I would say, having been a Dean now for over 10 years, this is the first time I've actually got to come, got, got to attend, to be with you in the sections retreat, because uh, I've always heard this is where all the fun happens um, and all the, all, where all the hard work um, begins and the networking that you're able to do has really been uh, really important. I want to spend a few minutes just talking a little bit about zooming out a bit in terms of uh, focusing on what we produce as schools and programs in terms of uh, graduates who ultimately impact the health of our nation and our world uh, in terms of bringing evidence-based public health systems to fruition, to uh, impact the health of populations and ultimately uh, do what we've all uh, really dedicated ourselves to, which is to improve the health equity, the equity overall, the ability for people to live and work in an environment where they can do their best. That's our quest, and I think that's why most of us came to this field. The other sort of title I would have for this work is Standards, Systems, and Relevance, um, pro uh, providing 
uh, standards uh, for effective uh, practice. Um, another way of putting it would be uh, to talk about it as our quest for, pub for a national public health system competency, uh, and in particular to do it in a collection of largely uh, boutique uh, organizations, both large and small, public and private. So again, uh, I, I think that as we think about the, our world, we've, we've seen enormous change. And uh, again, nothing could be more relevant for us as to just reflect on the changes that have occurred as a result of COVID. I wanted to say, I, I started this work. I came to public health uh, administration as the dean uh, but, but before I did that, I spent over 25 years um, leading large complex organizations, both in the healthcare sector, as well as in public health at federal and state level. And it was really my honor and privilege to have worked with some incredibly uh, talented people. Uh, but essentially what I have done in, the, in that 25 years before coming to the deanship was really um, having a chance to sample all of the graduates. And it, again, in my experience at, in both Arkansas and at CDC, I had a chance to work with graduates from uh, just hundreds of, of schools of, well, schools and programs of public health, hundreds of, of great graduates. But the reality is they came from far and wide, from very um, famous and well-regarded schools uh, to regional programs that maybe just got started. Um, I had a chance to, to work with students from a lot of different perspectives. And most of those uh, students were incredibly talented with terrific uh, uh, training uh, in terms of foundation. But what I found as someone that um, needed to get a lot of work done is that many of our students, in particular those that came from uh, our schools and, and programs right from the very beginning um, lacked the level of understanding of the context in which the work is done. And in fact, um, it, it is sort of the sort of unspoken truth for those of us that are employers of our students that uh, we get students that get a great background in a school of public health, and then we spend the next two or three years helping them to be productive and to actually uh, learn to do public health. And I think that's, that's one way in which to do our work, but I would submit that part of our responsibility as leaders within uh, schools and programs in public health is to move our field further faster and to really focus on having students that are job ready day one. And I know much of what we, uh, many of our schools and programs are working to do just that. But we're doing it in many different ways, some of which are effective and some that aren't. But let me just take a quick uh, review to say that our accreditation requirements, our C accreditation, I think you can love it or leave it, but the worst part of it would be not having great standards. And CIF, I think, provides us with a roadmap. But those standards require that all of us are in touch with our employers our, and, and our alumni to make sure that our training is relevant and meets uh, the requirements of day-to-day -day practice. But how many of us have actually taken that to heart and substantially changed the work that we do uh, so that our work really is um, resulting in students that are relevant day one. And again, many of the works, many of the things that we do relative to um, the internship opportunities and all of the classwork that actually is now done outside within organizations help move us in that direction. But again, the idea is what are we doing uh, today to really advance and to require that our students are ready day one? One of the things that I wanted to visit about is the National Board of Public Health Examiners and the Certified in Public Health Exam. A little disclosure, I'm on the board, uh, so you'll probably take that for what it's worth. But the reality is that 
the CPH exam creates for us the opportunity as deans and program directors and leaders within public health to see how well we're doing compared to others. Um, not just how do we feel about our, the success of our programs and schools, but how do we compare to other programs and schools and what are the opportunities for improvement and um, to do so in a way that allows us to do that serious evaluation of our criteria in our, in our curriculum. The other thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, there are a number of schools now that are moving towards actually requiring the CPH, and we just agreed to do that. Our faculty, I think, were quite uh, committed to trying to move the ball towards relevance, and in fact, now required that all of our students, both our MPH and our DRPH students, pass the CPH exam prior to graduation. Um, and I've taken it another step forward and I've actually offered for all of our faculty and our staff, I'll pay for the exam and I'll pay a thousand dollars a year to every person on our faculty and staff that actually gets certified. Because I believe that that particular credential is moves us further faster and gives our students a particular edge. And I crave the ability to know how we're doing compared to the rest of the world. And I think that's really an important thing. The, the last thing I would say is that the Public Health Accreditation Board, now over half of the, uh, the uh, uh, our state and local health departments in this country uh, are accredited. The, the, over half of the population in this country are served by a state or local health department that's accredited. But how many of us have looked at the accreditation standards from FAB and helped in, include those uh, criteria in our, in our curriculum? Because it is our graduates who are going to be leading state and local health departments who need to meet these evidence-based criteria that ultimately will make a difference in terms of implementing change. So I guess my message uh, is that as we think about trying to move towards equity, we need to make sure that what we're doing is producing students, now graduates, who will lead our public health organizations and our health systems towards essentially an evidence-based strategy, an evidence-based public health that ultimately will make a difference. And I think that ultimately takes us further, faster towards our equity goals. And I think that we need to be able to pay attention to our progress. And I think there are some ways in which we can do that effectively. So thanks. Thank you, Dean Halverson. Our panel two presenters were outstanding and gave us a lot to think about. We saw and heard some beautiful images from both sets of panelists. Here are some of my favorites, starting with Dean Fairchild, pitching the camp, Dr. Trinidad Jackson, the up lifting image of the free birds, Dr. St. George, digging deep, Dr. Kibanemi, lower the barrier to entry, Ms. Hegman and Ms. Walker, things will come and grow. Dean Halverson, zooming out. Through both sets of panels, we've been encouraged to work upstream. This is a blue sky question and the only one I'll give to the panel after that, we'll take questions from our remote audience and from inside the room. Panelists, what is the most important right next step to take in academic public health to do better in working upstream? The first next right step to do better in working upstream. And you could tell this was not a planted question. <laughs> <laughs> and these are big thinkers. So we're gonna give them time to think. We have time, we have time for this. I think we would say, listen, actively listen to the community. Um, you heard our journey has been not linear and we've spent a lot of time talking and clarifying and understanding each other. 
and to truly actively listen to the community will change your entire approach. We teach this to our health profession students, basically improv skills of how to listen actively to patients or clients. And what we've learned through our discussions is how you then add also the community discussion to that. So I think uh, trying to draw a connection between what I talked about and what is I think a much bigger and more important question. One of the steps is to think about who already knows how to do this work and how can we draw from their models to do it? So there are effective models for working upstream. There are effective models for agitating for social change. There are effective models for working towards liberation. You're probably not going to find them in a public health textbook, but thinking about what we mean by evidence base and blowing that apart in a way that honors the fact that high quality work that's known to be effective is being done in a number of spheres to work towards changing systems and changing upstream practices and looking for those models and then thinking about how we incorporate them in our work. I'd like to extend uh, Mark's comments a little bit to say that I think if, as we want to move forward, I think one of the important next steps is to, as, as we think about practice, is to consider the fact that our graduates who will be working in public health organizations need to recognize and to exercise their leadership in extending their work beyond the governmental public health agency. Because we know that the most effective public health happens in a system context. And I was taken by the wonderful uh, description of the work by community health workers. But the community health workers are just as much part of our public health system as our MPH graduates. The reality is, is that the work that's done in schools and in education and churches and all of the community organizations that are part of what we call the public health system so much of the success of public health is built on the relationships. And again, you might say, well, those are the soft skills. Well, perhaps they're the most important soft skills because our students who are going to be leaving public health organizations need to understand quickly how to work and develop relationships that can then leverage the work that needs to be done in the community. So I, I'd start there. Thank you for the question. I think there are a couple of things that, that come to mind for me. And one is that we need to have a drastic shift. And many of us have gotten there, or at least are getting there, in terms of the types of people we bring into our spaces. And those, those discussions need to happen at the admissions committee level. What are we looking for in the students that we admit? Are we looking for the ones who are ready and able to do this kind of work when we are uh, recruiting for our staff and for our faculty, who are we hiring? Are we hiring the people who are going to be able and want to do this work? And then when we bring the right people in, then we have to give them the time. We talk a lot about this work, but then we say, well, really right now we have to stop and talk about our odds ratio, right? <laughs> or we need to talk about how to do an RCT. We don't give ourselves the time to have these discussions because these discussions take more than 10 minutes on your first slide and your first PowerPoint on day one. And so we bring the right people in and we give them the time. I think that starts us off on the right way. Oh, okay. Um, I would add that, so I'm gonna echo and layer on some of the things I've heard. In addition to active listening, I think one of the biggest things, and this was just shared by Paul, is around relationship. And when we talk about relationship, public health is extremely rooted in the ability to do partnerships, the ability to connect in order to make sure that your impact actually reaches the audiences that you desire. So it's really important to root yourself in relationships, both with your students, with like-minded faculty outside of the institution, because relationships are what move kind of everything. The second thing I'll say is we have to put a new value on lived experience because a lot of us forget that we are also patients or we were once students. So no matter how many letters are behind our name, it doesn't 
validate or invalidate our opinion. So for me, I think it's really important for us to really center in on how lived experience contributes to PSE or evidence-based decision-making. And then that value then comes back to intellectual property. A lot of times we have students in our classrooms who are bleeding with information and we will ask them to turn it into a project and we might take it back to our company and we might do whatever we choose to do with it. The important thing to think about that is we could actually be cultivating leadership within those leaders if we had true focus in our public health programs around leadership implications, agile leadership, adaptive leadership, active learning. So for me, I'll center it in the way in which we teach our students and how we revalue their intellectual property, both in lived experience and in traditional academia. Thank you, panel. We have 20 minutes for a Q&A and for conversation. There's the mic in the back for those in the room. Our Zoom participants, we have questions from you that our colleague at BUSPH, Meredith Brown, is pulling. So we do have a question from Zoom. Um, how can schools of public health respond to state and city health departments looking to hire staff with lived experience of marginalization and community engagement rather than academic credentials? I'm happy to take that one. <laughs> I think the first thing will be recognizing that there needs to be room for progression. So a lot of times we'll bring in people with lived experience, expecting them to stay in an entry level profession. One thing we know is that no workforce is sustainable if there's only one space. So here in St. Louis, we serve as the first and the only in the state who has a dual service model where we are not only a membership based organization, but we also provide direct services. What this has allowed us to do is actually take on one of the identities of previous health professions. Let's take nursing, for example. When you come into the nursing workforce, it started very communal. And then we decided to professionalize it for multiple places of access. So we have BSN, we have CNAs, we have RNs, we have LPNs, we have team leads, we have BMPs. So a nurse can come into the nursing workforce and work their way up. We have that same desire for CHWs. So we challenge our healthcare institutions as well as our public health institutions to really think about that career ladder and nurture that. In addition to that, we ask them to think about how they handle risk mitigation similar to how our funders would. A lot of times we find that there's less risk if you have letters behind your name, but we haven't thought about everything we just said in this conversation today and the way in which we might be institutionalized through academic learning. So are we really less risky? So it's really important for us to think about our fit assessments, and I'm not talking about your physical fit, but how fit are you for that? Because CHWs are not what they are, it's who they are. So it's really important that we also assess their readiness. A lot of times CHWs, for instance, might get a negative rap because when we get ready to bring someone into the emergency room where they are centered, they come back to the emergency room because they love CHWs. But that's not a problem of the workforce, it's actually our institution or the structure. So it's really important that before we say, hey, I wanna do right and I wanna bring people into this institution, that our institution is prepared to receive them both equitably, respectfully, and authentically. I was gonna say also that uh, a couple of examples, one is related to being willing to get messy a little bit and to think a little bit outside of the box. We partner very closely with our state and local health departments, and we are very big believers in the idea of an academic health department, and we help partner to strengthen those capacities. During the COVID, for example, our Marion County Health Department, our largest health department in the, in the inner city, actually, where we're, our campus is at, needed help in, in actually doing contact tracing. So I talked with our president and I said, you know, I wanna do something that will help support the work of our city health department, but it's gonna be really hard and it'll be a lot of people that we're not necessarily uh, used to hiring, but we, we hired 200 people to do contact tracing. We hired a lot of community health workers. We hired people on the basis of their relationship in the community and their ability to reach out to people that would be difficult to reach normally. And I think that that model was successful 
for us and, and the county health department and that partnership made us stronger and better, but it was hard. Uh, and we have to be willing to fight the battles administratively to be able to be successful in that and provide support for the people in our organization to, to be the interface. The second thing that we've done, again, taking a, a, a page out of CJ's uh, book is, is to work in our communities. And we, we're working in a project called the uh, Dip In, which is a diabetes impact project for Indianapolis. And the focus is three neighborhoods in Indianapolis where the life expectancy is substantially less than the rest of the Indi of Indianapolis and the, di and the diabetes prevalence substantially higher. We hired community health workers, we, but we did it within the context of working with partners in community health centers and our, and our um, health system, but also uh, in working in, in collaboratively engaging in the leadership of our neighborhoods. We did something a little bit unconventional and it again raised the ire of, of our administrative structure at the university, but we decided that people that were our advisory panel for the community that we were asking to take time and effort uh, on this project to be uh, actually compensated for their work as advisory council members and and because of their impact we actually believe that our project has been much more successful where now the other thing that i i've learned so somewhat painfully because i'm a little bit impatient is the fact that this does take a lot of time and but we have seen uh, over time that our uh, hemoglobin a1c levels and diabetes uh, patients is substantially lower now as a result of the implementation of the intervention that we had proposed and that we're working with. And again, I want to say in, in full disclosure, we're uh, working with uh, our colleagues at Eli Lilly and company who have been stalwart supporters of our community um, writ large from electric lights by Colonel Lilly when he was developing the company to uh, a lot of work that's done hundreds of millions of dollars provided by co the company uh, for work in third world countries. But it was the fact that our relationship with Lilly suggested to them that they didn't have to go to a third world country to actually uh, work on, on community uh, issues that really mattered. And that relationship then turned into our work in the communities, which then will translate into improved health outcomes. So I think there's, those are some examples. So I'm gonna take a moment and ask everybody to think about Think about the premise of the question. So the health department thinks that they can hire somebody who has lived experience and experience in marginalized groups or someone with academic public health credentials. <laughs> and the premise of the question is there because by and large that's true. And that's an indictment of us, right? So I think in the same way that we are using our critical thinking skills and our evidence-based abilities to investigate public health problems, doing this work and getting out of that dilemma involves thinking systematically and thinking in ways that are going to be painful about what it is about our admissions processes, what it is about what we teach in the classroom, what it is about who we attract and welcome at the table that leads that dichotomy to be the honest truth you know, at, at this point in time. And really that systematic investigation is the only way that we're gonna change that system. It's a downstream approach, it's a planting a tree approach and it's not gonna to solve today's problem, but it's absolutely critical if we're not going to be sitting in the room 25 years from now asking the same question and having the same problem. Thoughtful responses for the other two panelists. Just want to give you the moment if, if you have anything. Sure. Thank you. You know, I would extend what you were just saying and and recognizing that in my response to the previous question, I talked about who whom we're admitting to our programs. Um, and when we do do a good job of admitting the right students into our programs, we also have to make sure that we're not doing something to take away from them such that when they get out, they're seen as somebody with an academic public health credential as opposed to somebody with a lived experience 
that um, they can use because there's some things that we do do, right? There's some part of that acculturation process that um, makes them move from us to them in the, this, the way that they talk and that that's a condemnation of us. I would like to ask Sierra to share with you a learning that she taught me about what true community health workers are from the St. Louis Coalition's approach, which is very unique and not what I have encountered across some of the health systems that I have been educated by of what they call community health workers and why I believe you're all seeing very similar things that the community health worker um, effort in St. Louis is actually part of the workforce solution to some of the questions that you're asking. I've seen many of these community health workers go on to become other kinds of health professionals. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> really quickly, I'll say that we lean into the model that agitation outside of relationship is irritation mm -hmm. and you don't get anything done through irritation. So when our CHWs are out in spaces, not only do they root themselves in relationship, but they really leverage their lived experience as the way in which to have a point of commonality. So many of our CHWs are dually trained. So we have some who are licensed clinical social workers, some who are trained as social workers in their bachelor's degree, many who are addiction support specialists, a ton who are doulas, but they really do lean in that title of CHWs and it's for a particular reason. CHWs are meant to be mobilizers, so they're not meant to be case managers. In our health system, most often you see CHWs in, is this my mic? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Most often in our health systems, you'll see CHWs only serve in that case management direct service provider space. Well, what Heather has allowed us to do and many other organizations throughout our region is show exactly how CHWs increase community capacity by increasing one's self-sufficiency. So in developing countries, I actually spent six months in Cape Town, South Africa studying abroad and I worked with community health workers and I learned that they're elected by community, very similar to how we do our elected officials. And the reason being is because the power that they hold in that person's life is great. When they came here to the United States, it was a money-making strategy for our health systems. In St. Louis, we are one of the first who have CHWs in our schools, in our jails, in civic engagement opportunities, anywhere where a neighbor will be, there is a CHW. So to Heather's point, when we recognize that that's their title, but it's simply who they are. You start to listen more and listen more attentively and think about how you can defer leadership. Similar to what you do when you have a trainer at a gym. You go to the gym knowing that you can pick up the weight, but you also bring a trainer in so you can get better. It's not a place of deficiency. It's actually a one of strength so that you can beat everyone else out. So what I say is not the CHWs are superheroes because I don't want to put out that moniker. But I do want you all to know that a lot of times within our own care team, we have the tools, we have the power, and we have to take them out of the positional authority that their title might say and remind them of the innate power that we're trying to build. So those are CHWs. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, panel. And thanks to the Zoom audience for kicking us off. We're moving to those in the room. There are a number of folks lined up to ask questions. Next, I think is Ryan. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just, I don't have time. I really stuck around. I'm about to be late for a meeting, but I wanted to take this opportunity to, to say thank you for this space. Thank you all for uh, your, your points of view. Um, thank you, Heather, for the opportunity that you have afforded us as CHWs. Um, I am a degreed social worker, but I prefer to be called a community health worker these days. Um, I find the value in it very different. It's not that I am belittling the social work, but I've been in the social service field for well over 30 years now, and uh, I found power in being a CHW. Um, the question initially and what I've heard for both tables is what's the next step? Um, it's interesting that that would be what has stood out to me today, because when I think about next steps, I think a lot of people always think about next steps being somewhat of a home run. And what I like to preach to the people or groups that I face often is that it's not always about trying to make to 
achieve the home run more than it is to make contact with the ball and stay in the game. Meaning that we need to revalue the small steps, the small wins. And so when I think about the disconnect that is happening that we're discussing today, it's not just in our education, it's in our communities as well. When I think about the elders and the youth and how there's a constant battle, how do we address that? And part of the ways that we address that is that as elders, we have to be willing to give a little when it comes to the traditions, because the way that I was personally taught was that it's the process or the journey that is more important than the destination. That's not the way that our youth is approaching things. Now it's about getting to the bag. Now it is about getting to the point as quickly as possible, meaning that they are skipping steps, which is what we're here talking about, what is next. We need to be able to revalue what we think is important because if we really want to start growing together, we need to find the common ground and make that the value point. Just as today, I'm looking at a room full of people, where is our youth? That's a simple step that we can be able to take. And when we start collecting those small steps, let's find out where we are then. Thank you all. Any feedback from the panel? Mm -hmm. That's my director. <laughs> <laughs> the one you embarrassed. Indeed. <laughs> I, I would say to that point, we include students on our committees as we do the community. And I'm sure many of you um, have that approach as well. It's hard to get them to come to such conferences, but having student voices is very important. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. I had a question for Paul. Um, a follow up on the comments for the CPH exam. Um, and a, a question uh, extending from a quick story and reflection, which is I just took and passed the CPH exam. I think as some of you uh, are aware, there's a big push, and I think we just heard about this, for faculty to take the CPH exam. Um, and so what I wanted to offer from you know that is, is my own reflection and a question really kind of pushing um, on the utility and also the responsiveness. So that's where I'm going. And um, the reflection is, of course, studying for it and taking. Uh, after I was done taking it, I thought, oh gosh, would my student you know, be able to answer this or this? Does our program cover this or that? I would say the classic example for us is and are the questions around program planning and evaluation. Uh, we actually know empirically, um, there's some two studies, one more recently out of Claremont about the absence of program evaluation. Um, in CIF accredited programs. So for me, you know, the, the, the kind of classic takeaway was, oh my gosh, could, could my students, right, take this and pass this and um, been talking with our program just, just about that. And so I wonder, on the one hand, I could see it as a summative tool for sure, but I wonder, Paul, would you comment at least your or the board or, or your sense what is the thought on the utility of the CPH exam as a tool uh, for potentially informing curricula development or adaptation? And then the second piece is on the um, CPH side, how responsive, what are the cycles for where you might hear from us or others about what should be on the exam? Great, great questions. And you're exactly right. The uh... This year, there is a organized attempt to try to get as many faculty certified as possible. So there's a special rate for all the faculty. So if you're sitting here today, you ought to take the exam. And I'm speaking to myself as well, because I need to do it. But the reality is um, the, the biggest fear, uh, the biggest impediment to passing the exam by faculty in particular is our fear of taking an exam and not passing. Uh, and so let me assure you that we've gone to the extra 
attention to try to make sure that your dean will never find out if you took the exam. <laughs> And you can tell them if you pass, but uh, the reality is, is that uh, by and large, our faculty do exceptionally well in taking the exam. Secondly, the important point uh, is that this is an exam that is increasingly now focused on a very scientific approach to asking people that are working in public health, what is it that you do? So there's a job task analysis. We are now just finishing the second job task analysis that's done approximately every five years uh, and painstakingly going through and asking people throughout your day, what do you do? And what are the tasks, what are those functions? And then fashioning questions, going through the, 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 uh, uh, the, the psychometrics related to developing good questions and answers and so forth to make sure that it's reflecting the actual practice and, and not bias and so forth. So all of, those, all of that to say that we believe that the exam reflects the practice of public health, not what a bunch of faculty think is important, although <laughs> uh, I, I suppose that's also important, but it is really about what is it that people do and how can we begin to, to test on the basis of that. And that leads me to the, your last que the, the question that you asked first, which is, so what value is it in terms of uh, summative evaluation? And that's what I alluded to in, my, in the point uh, in my presentation. I think it's probably one of the most important aspects of feedback related to our curriculum. We may think that we have the greatest epidemiology curriculum in the world. But if we find out that, you know, frankly, we're kind of a little bit lower than average, then maybe we need to reassess what we're teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are things that we do exceptionally well. But part of the point that I guess I would make is that we really are at about the same point that most of the health systems were probably 20 years ago, enormous variation in what we do and not really a lot of accountability for the results that we're getting. So isn't it time that we really focus on trying to get better outcomes? And I think the, the CPH exam gives us one, one measure that is a powerful measure that we could use for comparison purposes, as well as trying to identify people that actually have demonstrated competence. Thank you, Paul. And if you're able to keep it to one minute for the question and answer, then uh, that's what we have time for. Uh, I don't know if I can do that, but I'll do my best. Um, so I, I have um, taken multiple certification exams and licensing exams from nursing to athletic training to massage therapy, on and on and on, and have also spent a significant amount of time in state um, public health agencies almost 10, over 10 years and uh, local public health and traveled um, through NACHO visiting county public health across the country. And in the midst of everything that we describe and the hope that I gain from seeing community health workers partnering with institutions in ways that are truly collaborative, I also recognize that our systems were built not for those most marginalized. They were built for, they were built for the majority population and we're only in our infancy when it comes to the equity conversation. We're already shifted from racial equity to health equity and losing track of what that means for community. I, I wonder whether there's a need for um, CIF and um, public health accreditation to be really reevaluating. I sat at the table and looked at the boards of these organizations and they still don't seem to look like multiculturally led organizations. And I wonder if they don't know what they don't know and what that means in terms of the translation of how my nursing exam didn't reflect my community, my public, um, my sports medicine um, degree licensee didn't re reflect my community and whether they truly reflect what communities are looking like and how their voice is seen and not, or not seen, how people are uh, seen, heard and valued in meaningful ways and whether there's a room for reevaluating all of those systems before we encourage people to take these exams in a way that um, promise to bring the equity that we're hoping for. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Those are excellent concluding remarks and we will need to move on as our time is up. I wish we had more time. I'd like to note that we have
um, are providing for those of you who have stuck with us for the whole three hours speaking of the certified and public health exam. Mm -hmm. Three hours, up to three hours of CPH credits for this time here today. Now we welcome Dean Perry Kalkidis to the stage to introduce himself and to begin wrapping us up. Please join me in welcoming our board chair of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, Dr. Perry Kalkidis. I was told I have two minutes to wrap us up, but I'm going to take it a little bit more. I know you're all very, very happy. So first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you for this exceptional panel today. Uh, happy Flag Day, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> happy Pride. Are we allowed to say Pride in Missouri? Sure. <laughs> Thanks to ASPPH and my colleagues at the U of Sandro and Lisa and others for this important series. Uh, and for, for those of you who don't know, education is very central to my identity. Uh, I started my um, trajectory to this path as a dean by first coming to the sections meeting in 2013 as the academic dean at another institution. Prior to that, early in my career as an elementary science teacher, mm -hmm. I had to teach kindergartners about science. And I was influenced in a great deal in my thinking about education by a report that was published by ETS, whether we like ETS or not, called The Perfect Storm, where in 2000, I think it was 2003, 2004, they published a report that was way ahead of its time that talked about the need for education to change, to address a demographic shift in our country to older, more diverse population, to address the new skills that are required for students, um, in the 21st century, as the economic shifts are happening, and the wide var variability in numeracy and literacy skills they see in our country. And so, if you haven't seen that report, I recommend you read it because I think it was very Nostradamus like in, in, its, in its efforts. Um, my other learning uh, about public health took place in uh, the first two decades of AIDS as a member of ACT UP, um, just on the front lines of learning about what public health could really be all about. Um, so, I think we all agree that universities are places where we prepare the next generation of scholars with the tools to do their work effectively. So we are obliged to provide excellent pedagogy. In my own institution at Rutgers, excellence in teaching sits alongside an equally important, um, as an equally important pillar to scholarship and research, which is too often privileged in many places, right? And to community engagement, which is too often mismanaged or ignored. At this moment, and with lessons of the last several years, it's important. It's, this is an important point of inflection for us, I think. And so we've heard many great ideas today. I'm going to summarize some of the things that I've heard today and then leave you with a thought. So here are some of my takeaway points or calls to action. I know I have 30 seconds, but I'm going over. Revise <laughs> curricula to develop the skills needed to confront the politics that are defining public health. Embed activism in the curriculum. Teach students how to embed, embed their activist perspectives by building relationships. And thank you for that, the, the, the beautiful conversation about relationships. Shift the gear in our curriculum from the documentation of health disparities to the development of upstream interventions that advance health equity. Mm -hmm. Confront the inequities and biases in how we teach and, and a form of diversity we never really talk about, diversity in learning style. Not all of our students learn the same way. Advance lifelong learning. We as teachers must advance our own skills. We as teachers must help those who are not us or our students learn how to learn, right? Next, call out supremacy that has dominated our field, the gatekeepers who challenge change. Advocate for the, pump of the funding of public health science and teaching science that supports the health of, whose lives, of those whose lives we're seeking to improve. Challenge the health behavior theories which assume, assume people are rational operators. These not need the, be the basis of what we teach, but let's not blame the poor psychologists for that. <laughs> <laughs> Incorporate public health in high schools and in elementary schools. Yes. Consider dosage. Maybe cover fewer, more relevant skills, but deeper bolster classroom teaching, leverage the educational practices and the work of schools of education, share our practices widely, as we know ASPPH is a great resource hub. And just something I didn't hear, but I kind of heard it, but I'm going to say it anyway because I say this every time I speak, push back on the biomedicalization of public health and the co-opting of our discipline by other disciplines. If we're not keeping our eye on the ball here, other people are going to do what we're trying to do. Finally, I wouldn't be very healthy if I don't give you some provocative thought. 
<laughs> so I'm going to leave you with this. This is my thought, and then I'm going to run away. Uh, should job analyses from employers really inform our curricula and our competencies in our exams? Should they? To what extent do these analyses really reflect the conditions in our society and the communities we serve and the politics and all of you should we discuss this morning? Do they? To what extent do they attend to the different types of learners we serve who are not coming to the field in the manner that differ from what is upheld by the average tower? To what extent do they represent the voices of youth and emerging? Are we simply perpetuating sameness? Is it just the tail wagging the dog? We are the world's leading academic public health educational organization, and we should lead with innovation and risk, and we must be willing to take the punches by challenging the norms. I ask you to look at or view or hear the last session at the, at the annual meeting that was where I had the opportunity to talk to John Moore and Lori Garrett, who provide some really nice and thoughtful insights into how we should train in public health. So that's my thought for you. I know you're all super duper hungry, as am I, I do intermittent fasting, so I'm starving right now. Um, I now have the pleasure of passing to the council, my friend and colleague, uh, the president and CEO of ASPPH, Laura Magatna. Thirty seconds, just to say thank you, thank you very much. This has been an incredible morning. All, everything has been just perfect in the two in the two sessions. Thank you to all the panelists insightful and thoughtful conversations. We have a lot to digest to keep on going. So thank you for all the speakers. Thank you for the moderators. Thank you to uh, the Boston School for Public Health, uh, Dean uh, Gabea this morning, and of course, Lisa Sullivan, who also is at, uh, leading our effort in Feminine Future 2030. Thank you to all the steering committee members that are here present, all the more than 100 people that actually are engaged in our three uh, expert panels. So this is just starting. I, I'm, I'm not saying starting because we have been starting this conversation for years ago, but what I just want to, to finalize just saying that remember that the future does, doesn't just happen. We are building it and we are building it through the actions we take today. So thank you for being in this incredible building project that we are building all together as a community. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being such an attentive and participatory uh, the members here in St. Louis, but also everyone online. So thank you so much for being here today and have a wonderful afternoon.